Hi. I'm not even sure I need this mic. <laughs> um, welcome. My name is Cecilia Rubino. I'm a professor of theater at Lang. And um, I had the great privilege of working with Rosalind um, Aparcirio uh, Ramirez and Sarah Murphy, um, uh, both of whom got social science fellowships and worked in very different, disparate places, um, and, but collaborated on an investigation over four months. We met once a month, once a week, forgive me, um, and um, interrogating questions of success around um, a couple of topics, immigration, status, and public health. Um, each uh, of them focused also on stressors and things uh, in, in different communities um, and have their own responses. I want to just do a shout out and thank you um, to Stephanie Browner for creating a, a space and a medium for our amazing students to share out this incredible research um, that they're doing. Um, and two, to Jen Regal, who's been thoughtful um, and m mentoring all of us through this process. Um, and to um, the freshman seminar folks who came in. And if there, are, if there are any freshmen here who came and were part of our process, can you stand up so we can acknowledge you? Anybody here from that class? No, but their professor is. So just thank you so much, because it was very useful in this process to be sharing out um, um, with juniors and seniors um, their thoughts um, in an earlier part of the process. So thank you so much and, and for taking your time to uh, come and spend some of your afternoon with us. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you guys all for coming out. Uh, my name is Sarah, I'm presenting first. Um, I wanna thank Cecilia for helping us and I wanna thank Rosalind for working with me. Um, so we spent the last few months working on our topic, which is success in New York City, status, public health, and immigration. Um, and we come from very different backgrounds, and we had really different topics that we worked on with our fellowships. Um, and I think when we first started working together, we were a little bit perplexed as to why we were put in the same group, because our topics were so different. But after a few meetings, I think we really realized that the idea of success was coming up a lot, both in, for Roz, the context of an NGO, and for me, um, in terms of physical health. Um, so we're gonna be working on how we define set success, and uh, what is social success, and if achieving success leads to physical or mental deterioration, can we still consider it success? Um, so a little bit about me, I'm a double major in contemporary music and interdisciplinary science. Um, for my first few years, I kind of struggled in finding a way to use the two together. Um, a lot of my music courses were about composition and ethnomusicology, and in the ethnomusicology classes, I was kind of taken by how valued uh, music is, just on a universal level. It spans you know, generations. People use it to tell stories, convey emotions, X, Y, and Z, but it's like such a socially valued medium. And then in the science field, our major is not a classic science major. It's a lot more about interdisciplinary science and how uh, government structures, social structures can have implications in the science field. So for example, uh, like not just climate change, but how climate change is made worse because there's uh, financial restrictions on eco-friendly options, so looking at the bigger picture. And I think through having such an open science field, uh, I decided to, basically for my thesis, look at if we can use music as such a highly accessible and socially valued medium, uh, can we use it in the science field to maybe fix a problem? And um, to understand my thesis, we have to have a quick science lesson because uh, there's only a few of us in the science field, so sorry. Um, but the first thing to understand is epigenetics, which is, as you can see, the study of changes in organisms caused by modification of gene expression rather than alteration of the genetic code itself. So let's say you were born blonde, but then your hair turns brown later. It's not the gene change, the exact like genetic code changing, it's just what's being expressed that's changing. And the way that this is possible is because 
this is my favorite science fact I've learned here, only 2% of your uh, genome is actively utilized, so 98% of your genes are considered junk DNA. And they're, it basically consists of like previous generations and evolutions experiences with like disease, environment, diet, but we don't utilize them. So the way that epigenetics occur is because there is so much of your genome that's not being utilized. Um, and it occurs through methylation. It's like my best example, I'm trying to convey it. So think of like, you know when you have gloves on and you're like iPhone, you can't make it work because your fingers aren't free? So imagine if you had like one glove on and you're typing with one hand and then you switch hands to type with the other one. You have both hands, but you can only use one of them at a time. So methylation is basically the like switch. It's like you're changing what you're using. Um, why does this occur? Well, many reasons. Um, diet is one of them. Uh, exposure to disease and chemicals. Um, exercise. Uh, medication. If you know like um, Accutane, people take for acne, that changes your genetics. So there's medication that can alter your genes. Um, and the ones that I'm going to be focusing on are psychological state, financial status, and social interactions. Specifically with the psychological state, um, the experience of stress, which is, stress is the experience you feel uh, due to cortisol, which is the stress hormone. And it's detected by the adrenal glands, which are right above your kidney. Um, and the adrenal glands are the driver of the fight or flight mechanism. So essentially, when you're experiencing stress, it's the anxiety to either fight or flight, to either act or avoid. Um, another important clarification is the difference between eustress and de-stress. Eustress is like good stress. So you have something you're stressed about, your cortisol level rises, you complete the task, and then your cortisol level is going to drop. So an example of that could be like an exam, let's just say in college. Uh, if you're stressed about an exam, you study for it, you take the exam, and then your stress level is going to abate. But de-stress, which is excess cortisol, is bad stress because it can never really drop in levels. So if you come to college freshman year and all you're thinking about is completing college, you're going to have four years of not being able to have that stress level drop. Um, and then in the context of we're, what we're talking about, uh, use stress could be like passing a citizenship ship test or gaining citizenship, which it is a challenge, but it's something to complete uh, as compared to succeeding in America, which is going to be something that you never really can obtain in the same way. Um, so just to review, chronic distress is just concern over tasks that you can't complete in a timely manner. Um, and it makes you constantly experience this drive to fight or flight without the ability to do it. And when you can't do that, the cortisol level never abates, so you have a constant high level of cortisol in your blood. And there are epigenetic implications. Um, so the FKBP5 gene, which is right where that little arrow is, uh, codes for cortisol receptors that are in your brain. And when there's excess, cort uh, excess cortisol in your brain, methylation, the switching of the hands, occurs to make it so that you code for less of the receptors. So not only do you already have high levels of cortisol in your blood, but now you're not going to even make enough for like a normal level. Um, so these genetic variations are associated with PTSD, which I think is an important thing to point out because I think we as a society kind of look at stress as like like a, I don't know, it's, it's not investigated as an actual potential health problem as much as it is just like, a, like experience. But you can see it's associated with PTSD, which is associated with trauma. So as you like have these experiences, it's not just a temporal thing. You're experiencing trauma, and recovering from trauma is a much harder process. Um, these changes are also hereditary, which is important. So if two people that have this mutation because they've had chronic distress have a kid, there's a likelihood that this kid could also have this mutation. Um, so this affects many parts of your body. But to start with the brain, uh, first of all, it halts brain growth, which is bad, <laughs> obviously. Um, it affects the prefrontal cortex, which is uh, in charge of executive functions 
and expression of appropriate social behavior. Um, when there's excess cortisol, it causes a deterioration of cognitive abilities. Um, the amygdala, uh, which is responsible for detecting fear, processing decisions and emotions. And when you have excess cortisol, you have more intense emotional responses, as well as more intense uh, reactions to fear. And then in the hippocampus, which is in charge of memory, your ability to trigger memories starts to weaken. Um, and while these are all bad, they can also lead to physical issues. <laughs> uh, depression and anxiety, which makes sense when you look at this, but also heart disease, diabetes, immune system issues, tumor growth, brain cancer, schizophrenia, and respiratory infections. And again, I think that when we think about stress, we don't think about the implications of it, but as you can see, they are very intense. Um, so in working on my thesis, I'm kind of analyzing the effect of chronic distress and who and the social justice aspect of it, because I think a lot of our school really does influence you to look at it in that perspective. So there's a study that was done by the American Psychological Association called the Impact of Discrimination. Uh, it was a survey on 3,361 adults with varying demographics in age, race and ethnicity, geographic setting, disability status, gender, and income. And I'm gonna review some of the findings that I think are important. Um, first of all, this is, <clears throat> this shows that white adults are less likely to rate common stressors as significant stress, which I think shows that social privilege does affect how you're stressed, which is an important conclusion. Um, this one is really interesting when we look at de-stress and eustress. There's higher rates of stress related to job stability within non-white communities, whereas white communities may be more susceptible to stress about getting a job. So when we think about stress about getting a job, you want a job, you go to the interview, you either get it or you don't. If you do, your stress abates. But if you're constantly concerned about maintaining a job, that's going to present as de-stress. Um, and numerous non-white participants reported that their identity was a factor in getting promotions, everyday interactions with employers, law enforcement, and various forms of social stability. So if you're constantly in a position where you're worried about your stability, you're gonna have higher rates of de-stress instead of eustress. Um, another one, this is just emphasizing right up there about um, interactions with children. Um, if someone is stressed, they would bring it back into their home life. And early childhood experiences with stress lead to lower stress tolerance later in life. So as you can see up there, it says, they, uh, one of the symptoms is losing patience or yelling at my children. So if non-white parents are more susceptible to this kind of stress, it can cause non-white children to be less adaptable to chronic stress, causing the health consequences of chronic stress that I talked about to be activated earlier. Um, and then my theory about this graphic, which shows the average stress level by generation, is, as you can see, it's higher in younger generations. And my theory is, as the epigenetic changes occur, the offspring of stress individuals have lower ability to handle stress, making them more susceptible to higher stress levels. But before you stress about stress, which is what I've been doing for the last few months, <laughs> um, just as all of the changes that are negative are occurring, they can also happen positively. So just as the environment affects your genes negatively, it can also do it positively. So uh, by physical activity, um, a good diet, and a big one is meditation or practicing mindfulness, um, which when you think about it, if you've had like a stressful day at work, you might not want to just like go home and meditate. It doesn't seem like the most optimal idea. Um, but through, I think that through utilizing other mediums, we can practice it. And my proposal is through music. Um, it's based on the neurological implications of music. So something that's really crazy to me is that music precedes our understanding of language. If you think about a baby that's crying, you don't talk to it. You would like rock it, you know, or sing a lullaby, and that calms them. Um, so in a lot of studies, it's been proven that uh, certain temporal, rhythmic, uh, and tonal qualities can allow your mind to release certain neurotransmitters. Uh, one of them is serotonin, which is known as a natural mood stabilizer. It's utilized 
in antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication. Um, it regulates depression and anxiety, helps heal his wounds, so it helps your immune system, uh, and it maintains bodily functions, so like your sleep cycle or your digestive cycle. Um, and it also can cause the release of dopamine, which is associated with pleasure and reward. And while both of these are also, they're good anyways, they also counteract the effects of cortisol. Um, so back in the social justice realm, I think one thing that I was taken by is if we're looking at who's affected by stress and it's more predominant in non-white communities, uh, if, if non-white community members are seeking mental health support or therapists, there's a huge lack of non-white therapists, which can be even more isolating. Um, and when I was looking at music therapy as a form of response to this, uh, I believe 89.7% of music therapists globally are white, so it just further isolates communities from the help they might want. Um, it also can be expensive. It's not very accessible geographically when you look at the communities that we're talking about. There's not a large amount of music therapists. Uh, and it's also part of what could be a potentially stigmatized field of mental health. Um, my proposal is regarding music medicine which you don't need to be board certified for. Um, and it's generally utilized in patient doctor, patient nurse relationships. So um, let's say you're getting an invasive surgery, you can work with a nurse or a doctor to choose music to listen to pre, during, and post surgery. And it's proven to help people recover faster. Um, then this is a study that's a huge part of my thesis. Um, it's called The Effects of Music and Music Therapy on Mood in Neurological Patients. Uh, it was a summative study that took 25 studies utilizing music in treatment. And their conclusion was that music therapy and other musical approaches seem to be effective, inexpensive, and non-invasive. Uh, and there's no adverse side effects. And it's not the role of the therapist, this is the very important part, that. Um, makes it applicable, but it's the actual content of the musical stimu stimuli and the activity of listening to the music. So I'm kind of taking this as if we have a format in which this form of stress therapy is more accessible, it's not the actual role of the therapist, of the doctor, of the medical field, but the actual experience of sitting and listening to the music or making the music. Um, and since we're talking about New York City, uh, I thought I would look at these aspects. So in New York City, Latinx adolescents feel disproportionately sad or hopeless and are more likely to attempt suicide. Uh, African Americans and Asians are less likely to receive counseling or take medication. Uh, the rates of receiving mental health treatment has been found to be lower in African Americans and Latinos compared to whites. And people from the city's lowest income neighborhoods are twice as likely to be hospitalized for mental illness compared to residents from the highest income neighborhoods. I think that point is really important because there's a lot of uh, instances in which people of color will go to a medical professional and instead of addressing the issue that they have or helping them talk through it, they'll get diagnosed with something like schizophrenia and hospitalized instead of getting actual help that they might need. So my thesis proposal is basically, can we use the neurological and biochemical qualities provided by music medicine to create a more accessible, less stigmatized form of stress therapy. Um, and it could provide a form of therapy for those that are facing more challenges, like the populations I've talked about, that are working for their success. That's the key. Um, so this is <laughs> still working on my thesis. Got a month. Um, but what I'm basically doing is making a website um, in which you can, first for understanding your brain, basically you can understand what I've talked about in terms of what music does to your brain, what stress does to your brain, and the social implications. And then under playlists, there's going to be playlists that I've made that are based off of studies that have been done that are proven to cause these neurotransmitters to be released. Um, and then there's an interactive portion that's basically based in, going back to the social justice focus, um, in a lot of the research I've done on music medicine and music therapy, a lot of the music that it's based in is very Western-centric or white artists. And I think in talking about how there's already such a lack of presence of therapists of color or therapists for those communities, 
I don't want to get stuck in that same position where like here's your form of stress therapy, but also like you're still not really feeling like a part of it. So uh, I'm working on trying to find and accumulate data about music that isn't by white artists or Western-centric artists. And I think the interactive part is also important for me uh, as a white person that's working to be an ally and working to promote these ideas. I think it's very important to allow other people to speak where they should be speaking and give them a platform. Oops, wrong way. Um, so I think one of the things that was really important for me in working with Rosalind was that in writing my thesis, I've been doing so much reading, like scientific reading about different populations. And when you start having just so many like statistical analysis and data, it's easy to start separating it from the actual experiences and stories of those that you're talking about. So um, I think working with Roz and hearing about her stories, which she was generous enough to share with me, I think it was really good in reminding me that this is like, you can't just separate what you're studying from the people that you're trying to create a solution for. Um, so with that, lead to Roz. Hi. Um, I want to say thank you, and I'm very grateful to all of you who are here today to see our panel presentation, and a huge thanks to Sarah for her presentation for introducing me, as well as Cecilia, our advisor. Um, I'll be presenting today on measuring success in New York City um, in terms of immigration, status, and resources. Um, again, my name is Rosalind Aparicio Ramirez, and I am a dual degree student here at the New School. Um, I am at Lang for Global Studies and Parsons for Fine Arts with a minor in psychology. So before I begin um, my presentation, I would like to uh, give a little disclosure, I guess, that this is my community that I will be presenting on, but I am choosing today not to tell my story for the purposes of this presentation. And um, I'm doing this because I personally fear that, feel that there is a danger in taking one story as a story of many and trivializing it or boiling it down to a 15-minute presentation when there are many complexities that it can take on. Um, I wouldn't want to lose those who can't entirely relate to my experience or try to change it to fit the things that I am presenting on today. And uh, most importantly, my story should not be an entryway into this subject, um, as I should not be needed to uh, expose my vulnerability for the subject matter to be understood. Um, and furthermore, uh, this is a uh, a story that I share collectively with my family and with my community, and I wouldn't want to disclose it without everyone's collective permission. Um, so that being said, um, I am here on behalf of the Eugene Lang Social Sciences Fellowship. Um, I was awarded this fellowship in spring 2018. Uh, during that time, I was taking a course called Culture, Ethnicity, and Mental Health for my psychology major, which if there are any students out in the crowd who are interested in that field, I very much uh, recommend that course. Um, in that course, we learned alternative ways of approaching psychology um, and I guess diagnoses and different ways of treatment and resources for different cultures. Um, and in this course, I got really interested in the idea of resources and accessibility available to different um, affinities and people. Um, and through this course, I was recommended for the fellowship. Uh, for those of you who are interested, I guess, in the process of it, um, I applied for the first round, was accepted, interviewed with the director of the program, and during this time, I was able to choose from a list of different placements that you can uh, work or intern for over the summer. Uh, and my first and foremost placement was uh, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs here in New York City. I'm from a rural town in North Carolina, so the idea of an entire office dedicated to immigrants was completely foreign to me. And I was very much interested to seeing what they were working on and what they had to say. Um, so after that, I was able to interview there and again with the director and was able to get this fellowship to do more research on resources and um, immigrants here in the city. 
And this research is particularly interesting to me because in this city, 40% of all um, residents are foreign born and 60% are immigrants or the child of one. Um, on top of that, uh, of those who are foreign born, 20.6% are naturalized citizens, 10.9% are green card holders or have other status, and 63 are undocumented. So my research questions for this project are uh, mostly dealing with uh, Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and another nonprofit organization, New Sanctuary Coalition, which works out of Judson Memorial Church, not too far from here. Um, I'm mostly focusing on their legal aid programs, um, the Mayor's Office Know Your Rights uh, forums, and um, Action NYC, and New Sanctuary Coalition's Pro Se Legal Clinics at their center. Um, I'm looking at how they are reaching and approaching their uh, the Latinx um, immigrant community here in New York City, particularly the marginalized Latinx immigrant community, um, and how they work together and how they work with this demographic, and how they approach definitions of success and how terms of acculturation come up in that. So firstly, to define acculturation, according to Dr. Barry in 1997, um, acculturation can be defined as the encounters and ensuing changes between two cultures. Um, Barry's research resulted in this creation of a bi-dimensional matrix that uh, takes into account identification with home and receiving cultures, in this case, the home culture being Latin American culture and the receiving culture being that of New York City. Um, theoretically, uh, separation, which is the result of a high identification with the home culture and a low identification with the receiving culture, is um, the isolation of the receiving culture and the full acceptance of the home culture while residing in the receiving culture. Um, assimilation is the opposite of that with the discarding of the home culture in favor of the receiving culture. Um, integration is sort of uh, regarded as the ideal um, or theoretical ideal of these two cultures combining together to be healthily accepted and um, integrated into a, a new culture. And marginalization is thought to be the isolation or refusal or inacceptance of both of these cultures. Um, for the purposes of my research, I'm defining uh, this demographic as marginalized in terms of being on the margins of society and being on the outside end of what resources are available, as some have come to define the term, rather than Barry's definition of a loss of culture. Um, these marginalized immigrants experience higher amounts of acculturative stress, particularly those who are Mexican or Central American. So for success, uh, I think we can all agree that there is a standard definition of it that it regards uh, an obtaining of a goal or an accomplishment of something that can be held onto or sustained. Um, and I'll be looking at that definition in terms of these next programs. So I'll be focusing on legal aid specifically because uh, this country's environment has resulted in 80% of undocumented immigrants avoiding at least one activity for fear of deportation, with undocumented Latino immigrants supporting the highest level of immigration-related challenges, and that's according to Arbona in 2010. Um, so uh, it seems that legal aid is the highest stressor for uh, these marginalized Latino people. And so I wanted to focus on the resources that were being structured to solve and propel this term of success to solve this problem. Um, so I'll be looking again at Action NYC and the Pro Se Legal Clinics. So um, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, which houses Action NYC, operates under the following goals. Enhancing the economic, civic, and social integration of immigrant New Yorkers, facilitating access to justice, and advocating for immigration reforms at all levels of government to eliminate inequalities that harm New York's immigrant communities. New Sanctuary Coalition, 
which I was uh, volunteering at through the Sanctuary Working Group here on campus before my time at the Mayor's Office. Um, during my time at the Mayor's Office, I was stationed there as someone to give out information on Action NYC, IDNYC, and other uh, city resources. Um, and following that, I stationed myself there as a volunteer to get more information on their inner workings and pro se legal clinics. So I have uh, different perspectives on New Sanctuary Coalition as someone being there through a government institution and someone being there as a freestanding volunteer. And the goals of New Sanctuary Coalition are ensuring impacted individuals lead, providing sanctuary in the form of physical, moral, spiritual, and financial accompaniment, employing moral and spiritual language regarding the immigration system which rejects the hierarchies of value it seeks to impose, and a commitment to true interfaith collaboration. So, what do these have in common? They're both organizations seeking to assist immigrants, although their breadth is vastly different as they have different resources themselves in terms of funding and staff. Um, and just to clarify, the research that I conducted isn't really a comparison of the two, but rather a study of these two different types of organizations and how they're reaching out and helping these communities. So, Action NYC is a citywide community-based immigration legal services program that provides access, sorry, <laughs> that provides access to immigration legal services and resources to grow the immigration legal services field. Immigrant New Yorkers receive free, safe, and high quality immigration legal services in their community and their language. Through its citywide hotline, centralized appointment making system, and accessible service locations at CBOs, schools, and hospitals, Action NYC serves as the entry point for New Yorkers seeking immigration legal services. The goals of the program itself are to deliver legal services at scale to maximize the number of people who can improve their immigration status, connect immigrants to free, safe, and high quality immigration legal services as a fraud prevention strategy, to provide immigrant New Yorkers with connections to other relevant services, and to build city and field capacity for the provision of high quality immigrant legal services. So during my time at the mayor's office, I was mostly stationed as someone who was working in correspondence or assisting in Know Your Rights forums, which went around the city to um, provide information on resources available, but I was also very interested in this idea of Action NYC, which was uh, something that allowed people to theoretically change their immigration status, which again, being from a place that is not like New York City, it was very incredible to me that such a program had been conceived and was working and had been in, in constant progression for at least three years by the time that I heard of it. Um, I was particularly interested in the program also because they touted a 97% approval rating of those seeking immigration benefits through their program, which to me was very shocking, being that I come from a community that often seeks legal um, immigration status. Uh, I did not know that a 97% approval rating was something that was feasible. And uh, through research and interviewing of core members of the Action NYC team, I found that this is partly because they separate cases into straightforward and complex categories. So uh, when one seeks services through Action NYC, you're screened either through the hotline or through appointments at CBOs, health and hospitals, or schools, and here your case is determined to be straightforward or complex. Straightforward cases um, include applications for citizenship, petitions for alien relatives, um, naturalization, adjustment of status, uh, permanent resident card, DACA, or TPS renewals. Complex cases are cases like special juvenile immigration status, removal defenses, asylum, extensive criminal history or complicated immigration history. So those who are deemed to be complex cases are often referred outside of the system of Action NYC and so are therefore not included in the 97% approval rating. Uh, when I inquired more about how these people were being tracked to see if they were able to receive help through these outside references, um, I was told that this was not uh, this information was not calculated uh, for um, the reason being that they could not hold on to information of vulnerable peoples. But um, 
Yeah, so uh, that information is not known, but the 97% approval rating is. Um, further than this, when I interviewed a core member of Action NYC, uh, their first three questions that they held as goals were how many people are we serving, how many cases are we opening and filing, and what is our case success rate. Um, during my time stationed at a new sanctuary coalition on behalf of the mayor's office, I, like I said, went there uh, to table with different resources and materials. And I was specifically told not to bring out my Action NYC material because it would not help those who were seeking assistance through New Sanctuary Coalition. And that is because most people that are seeking help there are asylum seekers or seeking some or other complex case. They often don't have identification and therefore are not um, are not likely to be helped by Action NYC. Um, and that being said, there are hundreds of people that come to these pro se clinics weekly. Uh, with uh, very little volunteers, a very hardworking team. Um, so it was shocking to me to see that something that the city had was not helping this large group of people who were seeking assistance. Um, these pro se clinics, according to New Sanctuary Coalition's website, were designed to empower those who are leading the fight and to move away from the perception of friends or those seeking assistance as people who have things done to them, who are passive recipients of brutality. These weekly clinics are team-based and are angled towards instilling self-representation. Team members are volunteers, aside, of course, from those seeking assistance. Um, in terms of funding, which I think is very important when looking at a government organization compared to a CBO, I was able to interview Ravi Ragbir, the executive director of New Sanctuary Coalition. And uh, he told me that funding is not very much the focus of the organization, which results in the reliance on volunteers. Um, Ravi clarified that um, staff members such as himself are not receiving ideal pay and um, the majority of the funds come from do donations with very little coming from outside organizations and little to nothing coming from city, state or municipal um, locations. Um, this was preferred, Ragbir said to me, because as he put it in other terms, I will just say that the city is defined as difficult by them, and so they prefer to distance themselves in terms of funding. Um, so uh, to uh, conclude, I guess, I viewed success as a shift uh, of terms in these different contexts and how uh, the mayor's office includes integration as the ideal rather than as some have theorized would rather be defined as a plural existence of society rather than this marrying into because it sort of deflects responsibility from the receiving culture and places all the responsibility on the home culture to accept new um, information from the receiving culture. Um, so, and I saw this difference in how case filings at the mayor's office became friends at New Sanctuary Coalition, resources became help, aid became accessibility, and um, the mayor's office seems to seek to fix and heighten numbers while New Sanctuary Coalition is helping people mediate their status and survive through empowerment. Um, and so, for reflection, um, um, in my interest to pursue advocating for my community and others like us, both experiences opened my eyes to the different ways we manage and translate resources and have a real impact in how people are able to access them. I want to continue helping my community to be able to uh, really understand and access everything that is available to them and to change what is out there to be able to be accessed by all. Uh, no space and no policy can cover all, but it can come close to closing the gaps between these two spaces. Uh, I was wondering, if, since you were in these two spaces quite a bit, could you talk a little bit about, um, if you had to describe what it was like to be in the sanctuary space? Did you feel crowded? Was music playing? But, you know, what is what does it feel like to be in that space? I think that I didn't really have the 
um, intention of unpacking that before this, um, just because it wasn't a place where music was playing or anything like that. Everything was rightfully very um, somber in a way, and there is a great community that I was working with. It was often easy to you know relax and work, but at the end of the day, I was on the phone during the office answering calls from detention centers all day with people who were reaching out as their last hope. That's not something that is easy to find levity in. And the clinics themselves were this wonderful organized chaos that I wouldn't want to romanticize, but seeing them work is something that's really magnificent. And if any of you are able to volunteer, either at these pro se legal clinics, which happen on Tuesdays, or in accompaniment trainings, which means um, accompanying people who are needing to go to their court dates or other important appointments in terms of their legal status, uh, that would be an amazing help to New Sanctuary Coalition. Well, from the, you mean from the graph with the... Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't know the exact if what's going to happen. I think, um, I think that that graph is, or that information is revealing for a lot of reasons. I think it's also um, hard to like judge what's causing it when the political atmosphere is like changing so much. There's a lot more blunt, like stressful examples of microaggressions, discrimination that I think could be causing higher stress levels. But I think it is also fair to say that you know when you see that children that experience stress. There was a study that I read about that um, was done on kids to see if their parents' stress levels affected them, and only 4% of them said that it didn't. So I think in an atmosphere where it is a more sh maybe stressful environment, um, it's just being perpetuated onto the kids that if they have uh, stressful childhoods or have the genetic mutation, they're going to be less susceptible to handle that stress. Um, I wouldn't guess that it's going to get, you know, it's going to drop <laughs> in stress levels, but I mean, I don't really know. So I'm, I'm obviously biased, so I'm going to ask you a very difficult question, Sarah. Thanks. If you were to think of an experiment to test the effect of music on stress levels, what might you do? So I remember, I actually watched, I saw a poster of a bunch of students at a, a conference was at recently, and they, actually, they measured, they made some measurements of things pre and post listening to music, different types of music, and they had to sit through their exams and things like this. So I was wondering if you had any ideas as to what kind of experiment you might do, whilst also taking into account the different types of music that you were talking about. Like, so for me, I could listen to Pearl Jam and it'd be wonderful, right? But for others, so Maybe might not take the edge off. So yeah, it's true. What might you measure? How would you account for different types of music? Um, well, one thing that I was really interested, uh, my poor thesis advisor Jennifer Wilson has been experiencing me go on like every possible ADD tirade I could, and one of them was investigating the um, stigmatization of genre. So the fact that some people will view classical, like it's kind of a universally like, oh, it's relaxing, it's calming, but there's a lot of stigma around like rap or country music. Um, I think it would be interesting to, I think for my purpose of having inclusive playlists, I would wanna know based on identity if certain music would be more calming. Um, I mean, I think it's there's also been a lot of interesting studies done on animals that I've been told. There was one where someone was redoing a barn and their chickens started laying twice as many eggs. There was uh, something where they played music for like a thousand cows in Finland over nine weeks to see when they would make the most milk. And they really did not like <laughs> Bananarama, 
but they really, really liked Everybody Hurts by R.E.M. So, well, I think there is, um, I don't know if uh, I personally would love to listen to Everybody Hurts a lot. I don't know if that would be calming, but uh, I think there are conclusions to be made about the qualities of the music and how we can utilize those. It's kind of interesting that you brought that up with the cows because it turns out that that connects to some of the things that you were talking about in your presentation, which is that when people are under extreme stress, like famine or being imprisoned, they will actually lactate because it's a form, of, like if you're starving in prison, you actually have to feed yourself and so you will lactate. So it could be that the cows actually were really stressed and lactated more. We don't. Like there's an interesting well, that counteracts everything. So it, could have been, it, it could have been that they weren't calm, actually, at all. Their that is true. Um, I hope not. And speaking of stress, I wanted to come back to Ross, if I could, just for a second. I think it's so interesting that President Trump was tweeting this weekend about having the sanctuary cities take on all of the uh, recent um, asylum seekers. and clearly as a form of retaliation to the sanctuary cities. And hearing what you were talking about, it made me really think about how um, Mayor de Blasio is very strongly saying we're a sanctuary city, we're a sanctuary city, but then hearing about you talking about these separations of the complex and the easy cases, I'm just curious how you, you know, the sanctuary organizations might be even trying to think about how they would respond to such a, I mean, if that were to happen, how, what would happen next? In your own, in your own personal experience, having seen what you saw, would it just be a complete falling apart, or do you think that the community and the, the volunteer network would be strengthened by this sort of need? I think the New Sanctuary Coalition, I couldn't fathom having a capacity, um, but I do know that uh, during the time of the caravan, they were structuring and ideating different ways of tackling that problem, so I know that they're certainly uh, putting their minds onto how they would tackle this problem of, or threat rather, from the president. But um, yeah, I, I feel like they have a strong network. It's certainly strained just because of, again, lack of funding and severe need of volunteers, particularly Spanish-speaking, Creole-speaking, um, just other language-speaking uh, volunteers who can translate and assist in a more meaningful way. Um, but I do feel that it would be possible to to assist or for a new sanctuary coalition to assist, although I don't feel like that is their responsibility, being that they are not the sanctuary city, the New York City government is. Well, and also to speak on like false advocacy, we were talking about this earlier. Um, I was doing some research on how uh, the city funds mental health programs, and there's uh, one that was called, I think it's called Think NYC, that's run by de Blasio's wife, and they've gotten like, a billion dollars of funding over the last five years, but I was madly researching last night and there's almost no information about what it's actually doing. Um, some of the claims aren't really substantiated and um, there's a lot of people within the mental health field that have been saying, uh, so Think NYC really promotes uh, ending the stigmatization of mental health by like putting posters up and talking about uh, like, you know, we can just talk about it. It's, and like promoting the, la the ending of the stigmatization, but um, a lot of people in the mental health field have been saying stigmatization is kind of like a cop-out in terms of funding and that it's just a lack of accessibility. And by saying that stigmatization is the problem, you're putting money into the completely wrong place. So I think, uh, again, in talking about both of our topics, success and false advocacy, are kind of intertwined. Um, Ross, in terms of being able to cope with um, being somebody who is trying to be a resource and trying to be helpful, I know you mentioned that both organizations had scripts for you. Um, how did you cope with the stress level um, um, of, of, of having to be in a position where, again, you wanted to be an advocate, you wanted to be somebody who was a resource, but you had limited means. Um, I think each sort of helped the other in that sense. I know at the mayor's office I had instances where I was handling correspondence and I would get emails from someone saying that 
their family member was being deported the next day and we were receiving the email a week late from the Office of Correspondence. So by the time I responded, it was much too late and that happened multiple times and that was very stressful. So being able to see minute to minute assistance being given to people at New Sanctuary Coalition helped. And at the same time, I know at um, New Sanctuary Coalition, there were times where someone would come up to me needing um, some form of identification so that they could find a shelter to stay at or a place to live. And they had only been there for two weeks and their only form of identification was the picture that ICE had taken of them when they were detained. Um, so I could not accept that through the city. Um, and, and seeing that was very stressful to see my, lim my limitations as part of the city, but also being in the city, seeing the scope of who you can help with such funding and such breadth of resources, yeah. All right. Uh, I just want to say that the collaboration between the two of them was really a privilege. Um, some of these panels have had four people in them and for the, uh, a, a, a myriad reasons. Um, it ended up that both of them were together. And I, I just really want to commend you for the dialogue you had with one another, the massive changes you've made um, over this last, um, even the last couple of weeks. Um, and and uh, um, Sarah's really turned her focus from a project she did during the summer to really her, what's her preoccupation right now, her passion, which is her thesis. And Rosalind, too, has changed and, and developed and been thinking about how um, um, she is engaging and sharing her work. Um, but I um, really want to thank you. It's a privilege, and um, the, the few, we need you so much in the future. So thank you all.